so if you don't mind right now, I'm just going to pray and ask God for uh, some help. So, uh, please join me in a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you so much for this Sabbath day, for allowing us to come here and worship in your name, Lord. And uh, right now, Lord, I just ask that uh, you would be with me, Lord. I am powerless to do this in my own strength. And I just ask that your Holy Spirit will work through me and touch all of us. My voice starts to shake and I get in front of people and it's, it's brutal. Uh, yeah, this is not something that I ever expected that I would be doing, standing up here uh, talking to people about God. And, uh, you know, I think if you ask my family, they probably would say the same thing. They would say, there is no way that kid would ever be standing up here in front of you. And they're here today, so you can ask them if you want to. You have to sit right back there, you know. Um, we, my, my family, uh, I'm very close with my family. Uh, they don't, I don't think they understand quite what I'm doing here. But, you know, it's just, yeah, exactly, God knows, you know. They, they don't understand it, but, you know, despite everything that, the decision that I made in my life, they have always chose um, chose to support me. Yeah, exactly. They chose to support me. And um, you know, we have we have a close family. I come from a close family, very tight knit, smaller family. Um, my uh, I would say that I'm probably the closest with my sister. Um, we're about you know less than two years apart, and. Um, I guess in our adult life, we've been super close. I, I will almost say that uh, things probably started out shakier when we were younger, but, you know, I had a big brother, you know, a little sister, but um, as um, as soon as big brother learns how to drive, things change, you know, everything changes. <laughs> and, um, you know, um, my sister uh, recently, you know, she got married. Um, and that was, that was an amazing event, you know, a, a tremendous blessing to be able to be there. I have, I have not been to many weddings in my lifetime. I've actually been to more funerals than I've been to weddings, which is unfortunate. But, um, you know, to be there for my sister's wedding, it, I, I couldn't imagine, you know, a more special event for me to be at. Um, and, and, you know, it's cool, even, even cooler about that. My sister and I are so close that she actually made me her maid of honor. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't have to wear a dress or anything like that, but I was blessed enough to stand up there next to her and, uh, you know, watch her change, change her life, you know, make that decision to, uh, uh, you know, get married. And, uh, you know, her husband's a great guy and everything like that. And, you know, I, I was very, very happy for them when I was standing next to her. You know, it, it's one of those things that I imagine that if you have children who have been married and you've been to their weddings or anything like that, that, you know, your heart just swells for those kids, for your kids. And, um, you know, I experienced that standing there next to my sister, you know. And um, it, it was, uh, you know, it was, it was a beautiful ceremony. We had, you know, the, uh, we had, we had the, Dallas skyline in the background, you know, it was outdoors, the Dallas skyline in the background, the sun was set. It was truly just a beautiful, beautiful thing. And, you know, as, as wonderful and beautiful as all that was, as, as great as it was for me to be able to stand there and, you know, witness my sister getting married and everything like that, all of those things pale in comparison to what God has in store for us when he comes back to us. You know? Um, and, you know, that I believe that time is coming very soon. If you look outside, <clears throat> you look at the world outside, you turn on the news, you know, you see a world that is falling apart. You see that that it can't continue forever like this. You know, in, in no other time in her first history has have events been like this. And, you know, that, that's just more evidence that Jesus is coming soon. And when he comes to us, comes to take us back. Uh, to take us with him, there will be a wedding feast uh, that we will be attending in. And that's what uh, where I would like for us to go to this morning. Uh, if you would, open with me your Bibles to Matthew chapter 22. Matthew 
verse 4, it says, Again, he sent out uh, other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, see, I prepared my dinner, my house and my fatty cattle are killed, and all things are ready. Come to the wedding. Now, when it, sa it says that all things were prepared, and I would like to ask you, when were all things prepared for the wedding feast? When was everything prepared? Any idea? Anybody? It was, I, I want to submit that it was when Jesus said it is finished. When Jesus said it is finished in um, John 19, 28, 30, he <coughs> proclaimed that all things were accomplished and, and Jesus cried it is finished. At that point, the veil of the temple was torn in two. The rocks split, dead were raised, and, and after Jesus' resurrection, they went into the, the city to testify of, of Jesus' resurrection. Um, and so I, I think that the veil of the temple being torn in two was really significant of what he's talking about here in, in saying that everything is prepared, okay? And, and if that is the case, then, you know, what we're seeing here is basically he was, he was prophesying his death. Right? If everything was prepared at his death, then he was prophesying about his death. And that, um, you know, at that point, he, there, there was another call after that to come to the wedding. Right? But the servants, but, but the servants, again, they went on their way. Okay? They, they did their own thing. They, they weren't concerned about this wedding feast. And they continued to do whatever they wanted. And in verse 6, it says that they killed their servants. Now, turn with me to Acts 22, 3 and 4. Right up to the temple itself. 
Then one of the soldiers, without awaiting any orders and with no dread of so momentous a deed, but urged on by some supernatural force, snatched a blazing piece of wood and climbing on another soldier's back, hurled the flaming brand through a low golden window that gave access on the north side to the moon's most running sanctuary. So Jesus didn't just say that, that it was going to be destroyed. He said that, that the city was going to be burned up. And Flavius Josephus, again, he, he, he confirms the Bible, what the Bible says, that, you know, that this would happen. And Jesus, Jesus told him this would happen, okay? But you know, the big thing that I want you to see from verses 1 through 7 is, you know, yes, Jesus was talking to the Jews. There was a group, there was a group of people who, you know, would not, uh, there was there was a group of people who would not come to the, the wedding. They, they refused the call, okay? And, and, you know, while he was speaking to those Jews, and that is true that it happened to those Jews, I want to submit to you today that there are people in this in this auditorium who might be rejecting that same call to come to the wedding feast. And, you know, I want to encourage you and, and say, you know, don't put God on the back burner. If you are that person who is rejecting the call today, do not make it an afterthought. You know, it, the world, as I said before, it, it cannot continue the way it is. And I just want to encourage you to, to secure your salvation. Figure out what you believe. And don't, don't be too busy for God. Figure out what you believe and, and, and secure your salvation. So, we're going to continue on in Matthew 22 in verse 8. And we're going to read to verse 10, okay? And it says, Then he said to his servants, The wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore, go into the highways, and as many as you find, invite to the wedding. So, those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all who they found, both good and bad. Um, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. Okay? And again, this is this is more confirmation to me of, of the truth and legitimacy of the Bible. Okay? Because this portion of this, this parable, okay, it speaks of uh, a, a third call. We had a first call, people rejected it. The second call, people rejected it, and then they sent. Uh, and then they sent people to, uh, and, then they, and then they killed the king's servants, right? But this third call is different because it goes out to the highways. The king says that people who weren't worthy. So let's so I take a call out to the highways. And this is uh, this event, this is a prophetic account. Now remember, again, Jesus, you know, this was nearing the year towards the end of Jesus' uh, death, but he knew what would happen after his death. And, you know, back in Daniel, we find that Jesus, uh, we, we find what Jesus is saying, and, and we can confirm, we, we can tell you exactly when this call went out by, by the prophecies of Daniel. Daniel 9, 24 and 27, right? It tells of the 70 week prophecy. And I'm going to turn it over like that. You guys don't have to, but I'm going to read some of it from there. Right. Yes, Daniel 9, uh, 24 to 27 is what I'm going to read. Seven weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, uh, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and, and to anoint the most holy. And know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and sixty-two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall. Uh, even in troublesome times, and after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself, and the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood, and until the end of the war, desolations are determined. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one day, but in the middle of the week, he 
shall bring it in to sacrifice an offering, and on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. Now, for the uninitiated Adventist, this seems like a uh, bunch of out there stuff, I'm sure. But, you know, it says that from the from the beginning, or from, from the time that the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem happens, okay, and, and the restore to rebuild Jerusalem happens, if we find that in Ezra 7, 11 through 26, it happened to Artaxerxes, a decree, uh, the king of Persia, to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, and, and that was in the year 50, 457, we can confirm that historically, and you know, it's not, it's, and, and it's in the Bible, okay, so from that point, you know, we had, there's uh, a total of 69 weeks using the day year principle from, you know, uh, Numbers 1434 and Ezekiel 4 and 5. You know, we see that, um, you know, there was, uh, that in 457, the day year principle 69 weeks, you know, that, that puts us at, you know, right at 2780 for the year that Jesus was baptized, 3180 for the year that Jesus was crucified, and 3480 for the year that, uh, that this call went out to the highways. That's when the Jews rejected the Jews rejected God, uh, God's offer of a sacrifice, and, and they accepted, uh, and they did what they wanted to do, but, but God took the call to the Gentiles. And we find that in Acts 28, 28. Okay, so for those who have not accepted Jesus, okay, or do not have a faith, you can trust the Bible. Okay, the, the prophecy something that sets the Bible apart from, from anything else. Okay, so let's keep reading. Go back to Matthew 22. I'm sorry, I just took you guys Yeah, Matthew 22 and verse 11. Okay. Okay, and this we're going to find our, our last two groups. But when the king came in to see the guest, he saw a man there and did not have him. So he said to him, Friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, uh, Find him hand and foot, take him away, and cast him into outer gardens. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many, for many are called, but few are short. Mm -hmm. So in verse 11, the king is walking around, and as he's walking around, he notices a man without a wedding garment. Now, that indicates, that, that more than indicates just that the king saw a man without a wedding garment. That would also imply that as the king is walking around, that there would be people at the wedding with wedding garments on, right? Okay, so the people with the wedding garments on. And, and also, if they were in the highways first, and then the king saw them in the wedding garments, then there must have been some type of preparation involved to change from what they were wearing on the streets to what they were wearing uh, at, at the wedding. At the wedding feast, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. So now that, that's the, the so those are our other two groups that we have: those who are wearing their wedding garments and those who are not wearing their wedding garments at a wedding feast. Okay. And for the, the first group that I would like to discuss of those two is those who uh, are wearing their wedding garments. Okay. So if you would please turn with me to Revelation 19.
that those who are there in the wedding garments are wearing fine linen. And that fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Right? So, what you, I, I want to ask the question that you are the saints. And if we turn a couple pages over, we get a good indication in Revelation 14 and 12. It says, here's the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. So, the saints who are clothed in fine linen, which is their righteous acts, are, are a group of people who have kept the commandments and who have the testimony of Jesus. Well, that seems like legalism, keeping the commandments. That is legalism. You know, that's what, that's what I was taught raised in a, going to Sunday churches growing up, that we don't keep the commandments because Jesus did away with them. But turn with me. Uh, oh, no, I'm going to read this. Okay, in 1 Corinthians 15, 29, it says that Jesus was made sin for us that we might make uh, the righteousness of God in him. And, and I want to suggest that the righteousness of God that, that we are made into, it is not... Um, it does not mean that we wait, that we'll, we wait till we get to heaven. Okay, if we saw that there was preparation involved, so that must indicate that you know there in that preparation, you know that we are being transformed, and that that righteousness does not wait till we get to heaven. That righteousness begins right now, and and for and, and we believe in the law as Adventists that you know we should we should be obedient to God's law. And, and I would like to explain why briefly. Okay, there's a lot of scripture that you can use to this, but you know, John 14, 15, and if, if you want to check on facts here, you can write down the scriptures. But John 14, 15, Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments, okay? And and yes, he was speaking to Jews, okay, but you know, that was to that was for people who are following him, okay? First, but that's not enough. Okay, first John 4, I would like to explain what God's law really is. First John 4 says that God is love. Okay? And Matthew 22, 36 through 40, Jesus is confronted and trapped. They ask him what the greatest commandment is. And he says the, the, the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God. And, and they ask him, okay, well, what's the second? And the second is love your neighbor as yourself, right? So those those two those two commandments that Jesus he basically summed up the the first four commandments uh, which relate to loving God and then the last six which relate to loving your neighbor right and if God is love then that would then that would say that the law is a transcription of the character of God and so. If we see that, uh, and also, you know, if you reject the law, that means that there, there is no sin. Because we, we are told that, uh, in 1 John, that um, sin is transgression of the law. And if there is no sin, then there is no need for Jesus. And so, you know, there is no need for Jesus' to sacrifice. But as the, as the law is a transcription of his character, the saints who keep the law in the Matthew text, uh, it must mean that they also are infused with his character. And, and in, in that preparation, putting on the garment, you know, I believe personally that that there is more to it than just keeping the law. And that is an important part because I feel like it, it, is, a, it is a standard that we can measure ourselves by, yes, but I believe that there is much more to it than that. So, let's go back to Matthew 22. I don't know where you guys are right now. But Matthew 22, okay, and, and, and in verse 8, verse 11, okay, we saw that we, we deciphered that there must have been some, some people there in the wedding moment if, if the king knows that there was people there with help, right? So, that takes us to the third group. And so far, we have the group who rejects the call. We have the, the, the group that, um, yeah, that's wearing the wedding garments. Thank you. I don't, I don't know what's going on there. But, um, and then now we have the third group, okay? And, and I want to I read that to you again. Um, 
But when the king came in to see the guest, he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. So he said to him, Friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, Find him hand and foot, take him away, and cast him uh, into outer darkness, where there would be weeping and that should be tears. Um, now, that term, weeping and gnashing of teeth, that's a very, very interesting term. It's not used in a whole lot of places in the Bible. I can only find seven places that it's used in the New Testament, and each time that it's used, Jesus is the one saying it. And it doesn't make a whole lot of sense maybe to us now, but you know, we know what weeping is, and gnashing is sort of a grind of your teeth. Mm -hmm. And the definitions that, that I have looked up in doing my research, it had a lot to do with anger. And, and, you know, and that, that, that they were, that gnashing has to do with grinding your teeth and, and sort of anger. Um, but in order to, would it be safe to say that, you know, if, if we look at the, the places where Jesus applies the term weeping and gnashing of teeth, that we can then see, uh, we can learn more about who will be cast out, right? Is that, is that right, everybody? Yeah. Okay, but could we also learn by those who are cast out whether there's weeping and gnashing of teeth a little bit more about those who are wearing the wedding garments? Does that make sense? Okay, so the first place that I would like for us to go um, to look, we're looking, we're looking specifically for the term weeping and national teeth. Okay, the first place I would like for us to go is Matthew 8, 10, and 12. And many of you probably know or have heard this story before, uh, this centurion and servant uh, that Jesus heals. And in verse 10, we'll pick up there, it says, When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to those who followed, As surely I say to you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. And I say to you that many will come from east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And, and the theme of this account that I would like to draw on, I feel like, is, is faith. Faith is the, the element that is lacking, uh, you know, in, that Jesus, in Jesus contrasting the, the centurion's faith with those of, of that kingdom, of, of the Israelites, basically. And so if you're lacking faith uh, and, and you ca you're cast out into uh, whether there's new and national team, then those who have the garments must obviously have faith in, in God, right? Okay. Let's go to Matthew 13. Let's turn the page. A few pages. And we will pick up in verse 1. We'll pick up in verse 38. And, and this is Jesus' explanation of the parable of the, of the tares, the wheat and tares, okay? And basically in the wheat and tares, you have, uh, for sake of time, I'm just going to summarize it for you. Um, you know, there's, there's a, a, a farmer, essentially, who plants seeds. And um, the, seed, the, the seeds are in the wheat as a After he plants them, Jesus says that an enemy goes behind him and plants uh, tares, right? And, and then they come up together, and it's, so that's where we'll pick up there, okay? 38. The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them, uh, the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered, and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. And the Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom and all things that offend, and those who practice lawlessness, and will cast them into a furnace of fire that will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. So, again, we see that those who first is that they have faith, right? The second is that they don't have faith. Those without the wedding garment, the man without the wedding garment did not have faith. Okay? Or, and he did 
not have, from this text we see that he, he must not have had uh, a belief in the law, right? So those who are saints, then they must be obedient to the law. Because it says that uh, the law, those who practice lawlessness will be cast into, uh, into the furnace, right? Okay, so Luke 13 uh, is our next, next talking point.
But if So uh, this is talking about a, a faithful and an evil servant. One who, uh, are, the first servant, the faithful servant, it says that, uh, that when the master comes, the master will find him doing, doing the right thing. Okay, but in verse 48, we pick up. But if that evil servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming and begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the master of that servant will come on a day when he is not yeah, when he's not looking for him and at an hour that he is not aware of. And will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, again, both are in the same category. They are both, uh, they're both servants. One servant is doing the right thing. The other one is is treating his fellow servants poorly, and this is what I, when, when I said I feel like I believe that it's more a matter it's more than just a matter of obe obedience to the law because as servants of Jesus Christ we are expected to treat our fellow man in. In, in a loving way all the time. That's what is expected of us. And, and if, if that does not occur, if the Bible says that this person, the, the person who does not show love to their fellow man, they will be cast out where there is moving in national teeth. And, you know, as Adventists, we may have a good understanding of the validity of the law. Uh, that is not something that you know most Adventists really struggle with. Is that we we do firmly believe that, and and you know it can be too easy to sit where we are and, and look at somebody who does not know to be obedient to God's law and sort of judge them for not for not knowing that or for not keeping that. You know, but the fact is is that we we could be sitting there judging them for not knowing or looking down on them for not knowing and. They could be closer to God than we are because they are showing Christ's character to everyone that they meet. And we're showing that example in, in the parable of the Good Samaritan. So let's go down to, that was message 24, we're going to go to 25, verse 14. This, I love this parable, just prefacing it that way. I enjoy this one a lot. So, 14 to 19. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to the one, and to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, uh, to each according to his own ability. And immediately he went on a journey. Then he who had received the five talents went and traded with them and made uh, another five talents. And, and likewise, he who had received uh, two gained two more. Uh, but he who had received one went and dug in the ground and hid his, his Lord's money. And after a long time, the Lord came to this servant. The Lord of those servants came and settled the council with them. So, you see, okay, that that each servant was giving money, okay? Each was giving according to their own ability. They were given uh, talents according to their own ability. And and they they were expected, they, they were expected to multiply that, that money that, that did not belong to them, that but they were expected to uh, you know increase that that money. And and when the master returned to settle the accounts to each one, um, you know, to the ones who had multiplied the talents, they were given more. But, um, in, let's pick up in verse 26. It says, But his Lord answered and said to him, You wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown, and gather where I have not scattered seed. So you ought to have deposited my money with the, with the bankers, and at my coming I would have received back my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has ten talents. 
For everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the unprofitable servant into the, into the outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This servant who was given the one talent, he buried it in the ground. And when his master came back, you know, he hadn't done anything with it. He just gave him back, gave him back what he had received. And, you know, I, I've heard sermons on this before. I've heard stuff like, you know, talents. You've got to use your talents for God. You know, if, you're, if your gift is the same, you've got to sing. If you, you know, stuff like that, okay? And, and I'm not saying that that's wrong. You know, I, I believe that if you have been blessed with gifts that are, um, can benefit uh, the kingdom of God, then you should use those for the kingdom of God. But the one talent... The one gift that we have all been given and freely given is the gift of salvation. And, you know, that is the talent that we are expected as, as those who have accepted the calling to follow Christ. We are expected to multiply the gift that we have been given to those who are in a fallen world. And, you know... Just, I'm going to give uh, a little plug here for Pastor Harley and what's going on in our church. There is, you know, we have, we have all these Bible studies that we've been giving for, um, you know, <clears throat> from the size mansion for people in the area. And if you are convicted that, you know, maybe you sitting here in this pew have not done as much as you would like to, to further God's kingdom, to multiply that talent that you've been given. You know, I encourage you to, you know, start, start now. I, I, I talk to Pastor Brian and, and uh, you know, see if uh, you can help out with giving Bible studies. And I am, uh, so, I'm starting to run out of time here, but I have a quote that I would like to read from you from the Spirit of Prophecy. We have seen that from this parable, there are, Three groups: those who reject the call, those who accept the call, and they're wearing the wedding garments. Those who uh, accept the call, but, but they don't wear the wedding garments, right? And and here, with that in mind, I will, this is what I would like to read to you from the Spirit of Prophecy. This comes from Christ's Object Lessons, page 315, and it says, "Many who call themselves Christians are mere human moralists." They have refused the gift which alone has enabled them to honor Christ by representing Him to the world. The work of the Holy Spirit is to them a strange work. They are not doers of the word. The heavenly principles that distinguish those who are one with Christ from those who are one with the world have become almost indistinguishable. The professed followers of Christ are no longer a separate and peculiar people. The line of demarcation is indistinct. The people are subordinating themselves to the world, to its practices, its customs, its selfishness. The church has grown, gone over to the world in transgression of the law, when the world should have come over to the church in obedience to the law. Daily, the church is being converted to the world. All of these expect to be saved by Christ's death while they refuse to live his life, his self-sacrificing life. They extol the riches of free grace and attempt to cover themselves with an appearance of righteousness, hoping to screen their defects of character, but their efforts will be of no avail in the day of God. <clears throat> Jesus is coming very soon. You know, the world cannot continue. It can't. It will not happen. God will not allow this world to continue uh, forever the way that it's going. And, you know, it, it is my hope that in, in everything that, you know, I, I've said to you guys today, it is my hope that, you know, no matter where you are in your life, which, uh, if, if you belong to any of those three groups, which one you are, you know, whichever one it is, it is my hope that as you leave here, you will sort of take inventory of your life. That you will think, where am I now? Where am I heading? And where do I want to be? Because, you know, it, that 
time, because that time is coming, it is necessary for us to, to take inventory of our lives in this way. And, you know, if you place your hope in the Lord as I do, pray that He reveals to you ways that you can grow closer to Him. So, and it is my hope, you know, that everyone here is found fully prepared for the coming of Jesus. That Amen. We'll be together. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you again for allowing us to come here and worship together on this Sabbath day, Lord. I thank you for every person that is here in this room, Lord. I pray that um, now as we part ways, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would abide with these people, Lord, that, that you would continue to pull these people closer to you, Lord. We thank you for your, the promise of your soon return, Lord, and we look forward to it. And I pray that each one of us will be prepared when that day comes. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.